into law. Any other speakers? Mr. Chairman, I would urge my colleagues to vote yes on H.R. 1229. We are going to be looking at some amendments shortly. At this time, at this time, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman has yielded the, the balance of his time. All time for general debate has expired. Colorado. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado rise? Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee do now rise. The question is on the motion to rise. Those in favor say <laughs> aye. Those opposed say no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The committee rises. Take this with you, sir. And then you'll go by Monica. First thing you're going to say is, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, the the whole House and the State of the Union having had under consideration H.R. 1229 directs me to report that it has come to no resolution thereon. The Chairman of the Committee of the Whole House and the State of the Union reports that the Committee has had under consideration H.R. 1229 and has come to no resolution thereon. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the Chair will postpone further proceedings today on a motion to suspend the rules on which a recorded vote or the yeas and, and nays are ordered or on which the vote incurs objection under Clause 6 of Rule 20. Record votes on postponement questions will be taken after 6.30 p.m. today. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1016 as amended. Clerk will report the uh, title of the bill. H.R. 1016, a bill to measure the progress of relief, recovery, reconstruction, and development efforts in Haiti following the earthquake of January 12, 2010, and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Ross Leighton, and the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Wilson, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Leighton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, sir. And I rise today in support of H.R. 1016, a bill introduced by my friend, Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California, which requires a report to Congress regarding the status of post-earthquake humanitarian reconstruction and development efforts in Haiti. This bill supplements my efforts under the Haiti Act, which I introduced last Congress, to exercise greater oversight over the disbursement of U.S. assistance to Haiti to ensure that it is meeting the intended recipients and purposes, that it is advancing U.S. priorities, that it is promoting Haiti's recovery, and that it is not being derailed by waste, duplication, or corruption. This past January, Mr. Speaker, I traveled to Haiti with Secretary Clinton's chief of staff and point person on Haiti to observe some of the tremendous work the United States is doing to learn about U.S. plans for the future as well. Much progress has been seen in Haiti over the past 16 months. More than 2 million cubic meters of rubble have been cleared. There is now a better medical system and increased access to more clean water than before the earthquake. And the Interim Haiti Reconstruction Commission has approved 86 reconstruction projects, accounting for about one-third of the total pledges made by international donors last year. However, Mr. Speaker, with each stated achievement, we are reminded of how much further Haiti has to go. 
Hundreds of thousands of Haitians are reportedly still without safe and secure, sustainable shelter. A recent UN report found that peacekeepers in Haiti may have contributed to the environmental contamination, contamination which could have led to the cholera outbreak. Crime is reportedly on the upswing. Rising food and gasoline prices will make day-to-day -day survival even more difficult for many of the people of Haiti. And Haiti is still dealing with lingering questions regarding the recently announced parliamentary election results. In order for, for progress in Haiti to continue, it is important that allegations of election corruption are resolved quickly, that the concerns of the Haitian people are put to rest, and that the duly elected parliamentarians are seated as soon as possible. This weekend, the president-elect Martelli is scheduled to be inaugurated, and as the new government takes office, it has its work cut out for it. The new leadership must make a commitment to root out corruption at all levels in order to build trust within Haiti and with all of Haiti's partners. The president-elect's recent statements regarding his intent to pursue allegations of electoral fraud in the parliamentary elections results are a step in the right direction. The government must also make certain that the Haitian people are fully consulted on the direction in which their country is heading and that they will have opportunities to create a better future for themselves and their families. Civil society and local governments must increasingly become a partner in the ta at the table of Haiti's future. With the security situation reportedly deteriorating, it will be important for Haiti's new leaders to commit to the necessary resources to support the expansion of the Haitian National Police, as well as implement updates to the criminal code and other reforms to strengthen its judicial system. And I understand the United States intends to work with the new Haitian government to help Haiti become a more business-friendly environment. As a proud representative of Florida's 18th Congressional District, I can tell you firsthand the interest of U.S. businesses, organizations, and private citizens, including the Haitian diaspora, to participate in the recovery and the development efforts in Haiti, and that only continues to grow stronger. More importantly, it is imperative that the United States take every appropriate measure to ensure that our funding and our efforts in Haiti and around the world are not squandered. This includes accountability for UN contractors who owe a duty of care for the civilians whom they are there to protect. The report called for in this bill, H.R. 1016, will provide members of Congress and the public an opportunity to see what is working and, yes, to see what is not working. I would also note that the funding that will be needed to develop this report is directed to be pulled from already appropriated funding. Further, CBO found that the cost of this report in this bill is so minimal that it did not meet the threshold of an estimate. I would like to thank Ranking Member Berman and his staff for working with us on this measure. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues in support of our oversight efforts, and I'm so pleased to uh, join Congresswoman uh, Wilson's efforts in making sure that we can provide our great partner, Haiti, with the resources it needs to build itself up. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady reserves her time. The gentlelady from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized. I rise in support of this bill, the Assessing Progress in Haiti Act. A year and a half ago, on January 12, 2011, the world for the Caribbean island of Haiti and for too many of my constituents changed forever. An earthquake measuring an incredible 7.0 on the Richter scale shook the earth in Haiti. 
It killed elected officials, toppled the president's palace, <clears throat> the Senate, and all of the cabinet buildings. People are still missing. The effect of this earthquake is still being felt today. Basic needs such as food, water, clothing, shelter, and health services are lacking. Thanks to our military, the U.S. Coast Guard, who performed thousands of hours of rescue in the first 24 hours of the earthquake, the U.S. Marine Corps, who provided stability and protection, the U.S. Army, which helped establish logistics and additional protection, the U.S. Navy with floating hospitals and surgeons, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, this disaster was not the total uh, uh, disaster it could have been. USAID worked then and continues to work, coordinate and implement programs with other international organizations. Adding further hurdles to the recovery operation has been the widespread outbreak of cholera last October. Cholera, a disease caused due to the lack of access to clean, clear water, has killed hundreds of Haitians and has further set back progress in one of our closest Caribbean neighbors. The people of Haiti deserve the opportunity to live in a clean, safe, and economically thriving country. The people of America deserve and want to know how their tax dollars are being spent and need to know that the $1.8 billion invested in Haiti will speedily facilitate Haiti's transition to a bastion of comfort and economic stability. That is why I support House Resolution 1018, the Haiti Assessment Act. This bill, which provides for one of the first times a strong, fair, and objective accountability of how the people's money is being spent in Haiti. This report will also analyze how well the United Nations and other organizations and groups are coordinating their efforts to reduce duplication. Finally, this bill, thanks to heroic efforts of Miami-Dade County's urban search and rescue teams, which hail from the 17th Congressional District of Florida, who volunteered their time, effort, and energy to save lives. These people saved lives and helped find loved ones for those trapped in the rubble of the earthquake and for those who were worried about the safety and well-being of their loved ones. I also would like to thank, respectively, the chairman and ranking minority members of the Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere, Connie Mack and Elliot Engel, and their staff for making this happen. Representative Engel was kind enough to carry the language of my amendment during subcommittee consideration, and Chairman Mack and both the Democratic and Republican staff worked tirelessly toward a compromise that worked for both sides. I also want to thank our full committee chairman and one who I am so proud of, my Florida colleague, Ileana Ross Leighton, for managing this language in her amendment during full committee consideration of this bill. Perhaps a bright spot in this ongoing calamity is that Haitians recently elected a new president, Michelle Marcelli with whom we expect to work arm in arm with to help rebuild Haiti. His inauguration is next weekend. On Saturday, I traveled to Haiti. I met with Mr. Martelly. I met with the senators as they debated their new constitution. I'm hoping that that constitution will help guide them towards the next centuries in Haiti. There are one 1,400 tent cities, not tents, tent cities that house 850,000 residents in the streets of Haiti. No running water and one porta toilet for every 80 residents. Families are huddled under the tents, mostly women and children. And because the national prison was destroyed during the earthquake, armed bandits roamed the tent cities and sexual abuse against women and girls is rampant. The police force is extremely compromised and not trained. The army is non-existent, and many bodies have not been found from 
this earthquake. It is inhumane to send anybody back to such conditions. We must help rebuild Haiti. We must support Haiti. We must support the new president from this moment on. We must include the peasants, the agricultural community at the table of negotiations. Ms. Ma Mr. Speaker, this legislation is an affirmation of the generosity and will of the American people to come to the aid of a country in our neighborhood that desperately needs our help. The report required by this bill should help us channel our assistance efforts to make them as effective and efficient as possible. The Haitian people deserve nothing less. I strongly urge passage of this legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. General lady from Florida, Ms. Wilson, reserves the balance of her time. Ms. ross Leighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on H.R. 1016 as amendment. Without amendment. objection, so ordered. And with that, I continue to reserve the balance of our time. Gentlewoman, Ms. ross Leighton from Florida continues to reserve her time. Ms. Wilson. How many minutes? Five? You got five minutes? Mr. Speaker, it is my privilege to yield three minutes to the gentle lady from California. The gentle lady from California is recognized for three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the gentle lady from Florida for extending time to me to rise in support of this bill. I am now and have been for many years a big supporter of the people of Haiti. I'm the proud author of HR 14, um, let's see, that was HR 4573, the Debt Relief for Earthquake Reco Recovery in Haiti Act. Uh, it was that bill that freed up 828 million uh, that they would have had to pay out uh, for their debts that could now go toward helping with uh, the earthquake response. Immediately following the earthquake, there was an outpouring of sympathy from people in the United States and around the world. And I'm very appreciative for what our government did, what the people of this country did, individuals, churches. We have not always had our politics right in Haiti, but we sure rose to the occasion uh, based on this devastating earthquake that hit. Haiti. The international community pledged a total of $9.9 billion in reconstruction funds, including $5.3 billion for the first two years. Yet, more than one year later, little of any of the money has reached the people of Haiti. According to the U.S. Agency for International Development, that is USAID, 680,000 displaced people are still living in tent camps, and the conditions in many of these camps are appalling. There's a critical need for food, clean water, and sanitation facilities. A deadly outbreak of cholera has already killed more than 4,800 people and infected more than 280,000 people. The effects of the epidemic were exacerbated by the lack of clean water and sanitation infrastructure. Foreign aid without transparency will accomplish nothing. We owe it to the Haitian people and the American people to find out how much of this money has actually been delivered to Haiti and where that money went. That is why I strongly support this bill, which requires the President to report on the status of post-earthquake relief, recovery, reconstruction, and development efforts in Haiti. The report must evaluate coordination among various international agencies and donors, the extent to which U.S. and international efforts are in line with the priorities of the government of Haiti, and mechanisms for Haiti's civil society to participate in recovery efforts. I'm in awe of the strength and resiliency of the Haitian people. We owe it to them to assist them in their time of need. We also owe it to them to make certain our assistance reaches the people who need it most. As I said, we have not always had our act together in Haiti. Well, there has been a new election, and they have elected a president. There was a lot of turmoil and disorder around this election, but it's over now. It's been done, and we want to work with the new government to 
make sure that there is transparency and that we do know what happened to this money. So I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady's time has expired. Ms. ross Leighton continues to reserve her time. Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is my privilege to yield five minutes to the distinguished gentle lady from California, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who is the author of this legislation. The gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank the gentlelady from uh, Florida for yielding and, and for your leadership on so many issues, especially as it relates to your community, your district, and uh, Haitians in Haiti and in the Haitian di in, in the diaspora. Thank you. I rise in support of H.R. 1016, the Assess and Progress in Haiti Act, legislation which I authored to direct the United States government to report on the status of humanitarian reconstruction and development efforts in the aftermath of the tragic earthquake of January 12, 2010. And let me thank uh, Chairwoman Ross Layton uh, for your leadership and for your assistance in helping bring this bill to the floor. Also to Ranking Member Berman, Chairman Mack, and Ranking Member Engel, uh, and the staffs of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and also to my staff, also to the Republican and Democratic Leaders Office for bringing this bill to the floor. I would also like to acknowledge the hard work of my Congressional Black Caucus uh, colleagues. You just heard from Congresswoman Maxine Waters in terms of her leadership and her commitment to the people of Haiti and so many others who have worked tirelessly in support of the Haitian people and ongoing United States humanitarian and reconstruction efforts in Haiti. Today we are provided with an opportunity to not only remember those who have lost their lives, but to reaffirm the commitment of the United States to support Haitians as they struggle to combat the ongoing cholera epidemic and to rebuild their neighborhoods, their country, their lives following the devastation of January 12th. Following the earthquake, uh, many of us came together to pass a bill that I authored, HRES 1021, this was passed by an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 411 to 1. This resolution expressed solidarity with the Haitian people and our support for the long-term reconstruction needs of the country. Through the bill on the floor today, we are provided with the next step, with an opportunity to assess the progress that we have made, the extraordinary challenges that remain, and the areas in which improvement is greatly needed. I traveled to Haiti immediately following the earthquake, again in November during Haiti's recent elections. Many of us have been many, many times over the years. And once again, let me just say, I saw uh, real progress that has been made. Of course, the cholera out outbreak, an ongoing um, devastating setback. Uh, this, though, revealed the ramped up capacity of Haiti's national laboratory. The lab was able to identify the cholera strain uh, very rapidly, improving our ability to respond to the outbreak, outbreak, a feat that would really have been uh, impossible just a year earlier. However, significant improvements remain desperately needed. The unprecedented relief effort has given way to a sluggish, at best, reconstruction effort. Part of this pace can be attributed to the sheer magnitude of the problems Haiti faces, as well as Haiti's legal and bureaucratic hurdles, including the lack of adequate land tenure policy. Without a doubt, though, part of the blame rests with the lack of urgency, mind you, the lack of urgency on the international community's part. At the International Donors Conference in May 2010, 58 donors pledged over $5.5 billion to support Haiti's action plan for recovery and development. According to the United Nations, as of March this year, only 37 percent of these funds have been dispersed. This is unacceptable. If we are to break the cycle of disaster, emergency relief, disaster in which Haiti has been trapped for many years, we must act with the same sense of urgency in reconstruction as we did immediately following the quake. In addition to delivering on our promises, we must ensure that those promises are in line with the will of the Haitian people. The international community recognized early on that if our efforts were to be sustainable, they had to reflect the priorities of the people of Haiti. The establishment of the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission was a very good idea in this regard, and moving forward, we must ensure that it's inclusive, transparent, and adequately resourced. 
Additionally, we must substantially improve our communication with and participation of Haitian civil society. The United States and the United Nations are sponsoring outreach for civil society organizations. However, many Haitians still hold the perception that recovery efforts are dominated by exclusive foreign actors. Unless civil society, the people of Haiti, are involved at every major stage of the post-earthquake response, this perception will remain, and it will prove detrimental to the sustainability of our efforts. In this vein, we must give special priority to programs that protect vulnerable populations, including internally displaced persons, women, children, persons with disabilities, and others. We must ensure that, may I, may I have an additional uh, 30 seconds? Yes. The gentleman lady is recognized for an additional mm -hmm. 30 seconds. Thank you. We must ensure that these populations are significantly involved in recovery efforts, which reinforces their protection. The United Nations Secretary General, for example, has specifically stated that women should be involved in security decisions that affect their daily lives as a means of combating the alarming level of gender-based violence since the earthquake. On the topic of vulnerable populations, we must take a critical look at the resumptions of deportations to Haiti. Given the fragile state in which Haiti remains, I call on the Department of Homeland Security to halt deportations until it proves that its policy does not violate international human rights laws and until it demonstrates that Haiti is able to support the influx of deportees. If we are truly committed to helping our neighbors, we must ensure that we are not assisting Haiti with one hand while undermining its stability with the other. Do, do, I have, do you have time for another 30 seconds? Go right ahead. Thank you very much. Finally, <laughs> and lastly, <laughs> we, thank you again. We must continue to support the Haitian Public Health Ministry to prevent the spread of cholera treat those affected with the disease, and build up health systems. The international community must plan for the long-term presence of this disease, unfortunately, which is now endemic, and provide the necessary resources to ensure that the planning is thorough and complete. Throughout this unceasing series of tragedies and crises, Haitians have continued to demonstrate unwavering resilience, dignity, and courage. So I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I thank you very much for the time and also for your leadership. General Lady's time has expired. Ms. Ross Layton continues to reserve her time. Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, um, I had the opportunity this past Saturday to go to Haiti and take a helicopter ride to survey all of the damage on Haiti's and all of the hope for Haiti, all of the islands and the connecting islands of Haiti to see what was happening. The African diaspora, which is mostly members of District 17, they all want to help rebuild Haiti. They will apply for contracts, and if dual nationality is granted, they will also run for office and lend their expertise to recover to the recovery of Haiti. We all know that TPS expires in June. TPS, Temporary Protective Status, was extended to the Haitian nationals. We, uh, along with the Black Caucus, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, and con uh, Congressman Payne, were working to ex on trying to extend that deadline for at least another year. Haiti is in no disposition to accept any further deportations. Mr. Speaker, I have no further requests for time, and I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady from Florida yields back the balance of her time. General Thank Lady you, from Mr. Florida. Speaker. I also have no further requests for time, and I yield back the balance of our time. General Lady from Florida yields back the balance of her time. So we're here, please. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1016 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table.
Pursuant to House Resolution 245 and Rule 18, the Chair declares that the uh, House and the Committee of the Whole House of the uh, State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 1229. Will the gentleman from uh, Arkansas, Mr. Walmock, kindly resume the Chair? The committee will be in order. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House and the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 1229, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to amend the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act to facilitate the safe and timely production of American energy resources from the Gulf of Mexico. When the Committee of the Whole House uh, rose earlier today, all time for general debate had expired. Pursuant to the rule, the amendment printed in the bill is adopted. The bill is amended, shall be considered as an original bill for the purpose of further amendment under the five-minute rule, and shall be considered as read. No further amendment to the bill as amended shall be in order except those printed in Part A of House Report 11273. Each further amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the period of time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to demand for or for division of the question. It is now in order to consider amendment number one printed in part A of House Report 11273. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number one, printed in Part A of House Report number 112-73, offered by Mr. Polis of Colorado. Pursuant to House Resolution 245, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Speaker, following last year's BP Deepwater Horizons disaster, one would think that a foundational and critical element of any bill related to offshore deepwater deep water oil drilling would be to improve our safety and environmental safeguards based on the lessons that we learned the hard way from a horrific national tragedy, costing jobs, reducing health, and damaging the environment. Well, H.R. 1229 does include a provision that states that the Secretary shall not issue a permit without ensuring that the proposed drilling operation meets critical safety systems requirements and oil spill response and containment requirements, it fails to make mention of and omits requiring the Secretary to ensure that critical environmental and economic laws are adhered to, a prolific, prolific problem leading up to the Deepwater Horizon spill. Mr. Speaker, for years, an ongoing problem in issuing permits for offshore drilling has been the Department of the Interior's failure to follow requirements set out under our nation's foundational environmental protection laws and fisheries laws. These laws, like the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Protection Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Act, protect wildlife as well as fisheries and beaches that sustain the Gulf's fishing and tourism industries. In the Gulf region, the number of jobs dependent on tourism and fishing is five times the number of jobs related to the oil and gas industry. While reforms within the Obama administration are moving in the right direction, the fact is that this bill, in its current form, leaves out a major chunk of what should be included in any safety or oversight review that we require of the Secretary. And I'm grateful for the rule for allowing a full discussion uh, and vote on this amendment. Mr. Speaker, a May 2010 New York Times article entitled U.S. said to allow drilling without needed permits outlines the roots of this problem in detail. And without objection, I'd like to enter that article into the record. Without objection, so ordered. The article clearly explains how the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Department of Interior's Drilling Permit Agency, is required to get permits for drilling where it might harm endangered species and marine animals. The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, is partially responsible for protecting endangered species and marine mammals. It said on repeated occasions that drilling in the Gulf does affect these animals. That's simply science. But records show that permits for hundreds of wells, including the BP disaster well itself, were granted without getting the permits required under existing federal law. Federal records show that NOAA instructed the Mineral Agency to continue drilling in the Gulf was actually harming wildlife and needed to get permits in compliance with federal law, but sadly, those permits were never sought. 
With regard to the National Environmental Protection Act, the government has time and time again performed cursory environmental assessments, failed to integrate NEPA analysis with related federal statutes, and even exempted entire projects from NEPA review, including the Macondo Well. In the past, the only way to ensure the permits have complied with NEPA have unfortunately been through lawsuits. My amendment would require these assurances from the Secretary before the permit is issued. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Chairman, I claim time in opposition to this amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Although well intended, this amendment is duplicative and would add delays to the permitting process and production of American made energy. It is the responsibility of the Department of the Interior, as overseers of permitting in the Gulf, to ensure safe and environmentally responsible drilling in the Gulf. Since the spill last year, the Department of the Interior has made extensive changes to permitting requirements for offshore operations. Every drilling permit is required to go through multiple environmental reviews before the application can be approved. This begins with an initial programmatic environmental impact statement and is followed by a lease sale specific environmental impact statement and continues with additional environmental reviews as drilling activities move forward. In carrying out its responsibilities, the Department already must comply with numerous environmental statutes, regulations, and executive orders. These regulations include the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Fishery Conservation and Management Act, and I may have left some out. This demonstrates the redundancy in this amendment and why it is not necessary. Administration officials and even Director Bromwich have stated on numerous occasions to both the Natural Resources Committee and the American people that they would not permit operations if they did not believe they meet all the requirements to be conducted safely, officially, and in an environmentally responsible manner. The Interior Department already complies with these particular environmental regulations when approving permits. And the fact that the Department is permitting operations although at a slower pace than I would like to see, demonstrates that they have confidence in the regulations that the agency has set for offshore drilling operations. The real effect of this amendment, whether intended or not, is more delays to offshore energy production and more lengthy and burdensome lawsuits. So, Mr. Chairman, I urge, I urge a no vote and I oppose this amendment. Thank you. I reserve the balance of my time. Mr. Lamborn reserves the balance of his time. Mr. Polis. Mr. Speaker, this underlying legislation's very basic safety review provision simply doesn't address the broad swath of problems that need to be addressed by any serious offshore drilling project. My amendment is a simple way of ensuring that the many shortcomings are at least considered by the Secretary as articulated, articulated in federal law and are discussed during this debate. Unfortunately, this bill does not take into account the lessons our country learned from the terrible BP Deepwater disaster. In addition to accepting my amendment, I certainly hope that the committee will address these problems with even stronger language in any future bill uh, it does on the issue of offshore drilling in general with regard to safety and the environment. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Lamborn. May I inquire of the chair how much time is remaining on gentleman, our side? Mr. Lamborn has three minutes. I would like to yield two and a half minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the proponent of this amendment uh, and his zeal to ensure that the environment is properly addressed, but those concerns are properly addressed in the permitting policy. The problem is that we had a company with around 800 safety violations, British Petroleum, that was allowed to continue drilling, and you wonder why. Could it be that they were negotiating at the very time of the uh, blowout uh, with Democrats in the Senate for making the big announcement that they supported the administration's cap-and-trade bill? Uh, could it be that they were going to be involved in the carbon credit uh, business and would work with the administration? Perhaps a better question than the effect on the environment is, how close will the um, applicant for a drilling permit 
uh, be politically with this administration because what we see time after time is a situation of political payback. We see crony capitalism. If you're a good buddy at GE, you're going to do well. Uh, if you're on Wall Street and you contribute four to one to this administration over its opponent, then you're going to do well. You may have to endure being called a fat cat time to time, but otherwise we're going to make sure your profits exceed anything you've ever seen before. We have seen this administration rush to Libya. We've seen this administration rush uh, appropriately to help our friend Japan. We've seen them rush all over the place, but when it came to really helping the Gulf Coast region, this administration rushed in and did more damage to people's lives by putting this moratorium on than the spill itself did. At some point, it's time for the administration to to stop the political payback game. Perhaps Louisiana would be better off if they dissociated themselves with Texas. We know that uh, you can have 500,000 acres burn and be a disaster area. You can have two million in Texas. They won't come to your help because this administration is partisan and bitterly so. But it's time for this administration to quit playing political games and help people where they need it in our own country, on our own Gulf Coast. Let's, let's vote no on the amendments and get this bill through. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman is the only only speaker with time remaining. Then I would just urge uh, opposition and a no vote on this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have Mr. it. Speaker? The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Gentleman Speaker, on that I request a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 2, printed in Part A of House Report 11273. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. Number Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 2, printed in Part A of House Report Number 112-73, offered by Mr. Garamendi of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 245, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we just heard a pretty good discussion here a moment ago about the safety issues in the Gulf. And the legislation before us seems to ignore every one of the recommendations that the bipartisan independent commission made about how to conduct deep water drilling in a safe manner. Uh, Actually, BP did have a terrible record. I'm pleased that my colleague from Texas pointed out the 800 violations that BP had. Uh, there was, however, a bit of a problem for at least 11 members of the Gulf oil industry. They died as a result of the inattention to safety. The proposal that I have before us deals with one of the recommendations that the Commission made and that is that there be an independent safety organization created to provide a, an additional level of review of the requirements that drilling be done safely. Now, the legislation before us ignores that recommendation by the Commission and basically says that the American Petroleum Institution is quite capable of doing this. Well, the Commission, the independent, Bipartisan Commission said the American petroleum industry is culturally ill-suited to drive a safety revolution in the industry. For this reason, it's essential that a safety enterprise operate apart from the American petroleum industry, and I could not agree more, Mr. Chairman. And my amendment would require that the Secretary, in determining whether a permit application meets the critical safety requirements, that he must consult with an independent safety organization, and that organization must not be affiliated with the American Petroleum Institute. 
Now, the institutes said, though, no problem, we'll create our own. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, that's not the way to provide the appropriate safety standard. Uh, we don't need to have more deaths. We don't need to have more blowouts. We need to do the drilling safely and that it be done in a manner that assures that lives will not be lost and that oil will not be spilled in the ocean. That's what this amendment does by providing an outside independent organization with the requirement that they consult with the secretary on the applications. We do not change the 50-day requirement. That remains in place. And so there is a time frame. We don't change any of the requirements with regard to lawsuits and the rest, which I think are inappropriate, but nonetheless we don't change that in this legislation. I would ask for the adoption of this amendment. I yield. I reserve the remaining amount of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. For what purposes does the gentleman from Colorado rise? Mr. Chairman, I claim time in opposition to this amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. And I do oppose this amendment. Although well intended, the putting the Gulf of Mexico back to work act itself makes drilling already safer by requiring that the secretary ensure that any proposed drilling operation be subject to a safety review, it's there in the bill already, and that it meet established critical safety system requirements, including blowout prevention and oil spill response and containment requirements, and this has to be done before the issuance of a permit. The decision to approve individual permit applications is the responsibility of the Department of the Interior. I don't believe it should be farmed out to other organizations that may or may not have the background, the expertise, or the resources to evaluate drilling permits. In fiscal year 2011, House Republicans voted to increase funding for the Department of the Interior in order to ensure that they have the resources to safely, responsibly, and effectively approve permits. The Interior Department has a responsibility as it drafts legislation to solicit public comment and they do take advice and counsel from all Americans, including those with expertise in these areas. However, once the standards are set, it is the responsibility of the government to enforce the standards. Oversight is the federal government's responsibility and it should not be delegated to outside organizations. Whether intended or not, this amendment would slow down and make more complicated the already lengthy and involved permitting process. So I urge opposition to this amendment and urge opponents to vote no on it. And I yield, uh, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Colorado reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from California. Uh, an interesting uh, discussion from my colleague from Colorado. Uh, I would note that there are numerous examples where the federal government does rely upon outside safety organizations. For example, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations provides safety standards for our nuclear industry, specifically not allowing the nuclear power industry to do the safety reviews, but rather an outside organization. We're simply calling for a level of review that is not associated with those two organizations that caused the problem. The Department of Interior, and I was the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Interior in the 90s, have some familiarity with the comings and goings, the shortcomings, as well as the strength of that department. This particular section over time, this particular section of the Department of Interior has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that over time it has not been able to regulate properly the safety and other elements of the natural gas and oil industry. We need to provide an outside level of review on the safety requirements, both to keep the Department of Interior on the proper course and the industry itself on the proper course. That's what the amendment does. I think it makes an imminent amount of sense. And we're really talking about both environmental issues here, that is the health of the environment in the coast, which was seriously compromised, and also the well-being of the men and women that work on these oil platforms, and we know that their fate has been jeopardized in the past and should not be jeopardized in the future. I ask for a, an aye vote on this amendment, both here and later on the floor. I yield back the remaining amount of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would point out that 
there is a public comment period that is available right now and that is a proper and appropriate form for an outside group to make the kind of standards related comments that would be possibly helpful but when it comes to actually issuing the permit that is something that should be delegated to the federal government they do have the resources in fact they have expanded resources to do a better job of that hopefully in the future so for those reasons mr chairman i would urge a no vote on this amendment and i yield back the balance of my time the gentleman yields back his time the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from california mr garamendi those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Mr. Chairman, ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 3, printed in Part A of House Report 11273. For what purpose does a gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number three, printed in Part A of House Report Number 112-73, offered by Mr. Markey of Massachusetts. Pursuant to House Resolution 245, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, yield myself two minutes. Mr. Speaker, one year has passed since the Deepwater Horizon accident. Yet BP, Transocean, Halliburton, and Cameron continue to argue in court which of them deserves more blame for the 11 deaths and environmental devastation. BP continues to fight the estimates of the amount of oil spilled in order to minimize its liability. And more than one year after the beginning of this disaster, Congress has still not passed any legislation to improve the safety of offshore drilling and ensure that the lessons of the BP spill are incorporated into future drilling. The co-chairs of the independent BP Commission have testified before the Natural Resources Committee that the accident could have been prevented. And the Commission found that the root causes of the disaster were systemic to the entire industry. And their extensive reports documented numerous specific failures of the cementing, well design, and testing, and maintenance associated with the Deepwater Horizon uh, well. And recently, the Department of Interior's contractor, Det Nors Veritas, released its report on the forensic in investigation of the Deepwater Horizon blow up preventer. And here's what they found the results indicated that the drilling pipe inside of the blow-up preventer had buckled due to the force of the blowout and the cutting devices therefore couldn't fully sever the drill pipe and seal off the well. According to the forensic report, contrary to the claims of the oil industry that blow-up preventers are fail-safe devices, it seems unclear whether blow-out preventers can actually prevent major blowouts at all once they are underway. But here we are today with the Republicans bringing out legislation that takes no meaningful safety uh, uh, protections for the industry. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman reserves. Mr. Gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Chairman, I claim time in opposition to this amendment. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. This amendment was already rejected by a bipartisan vote of the full Natural Resources Committee, and once again I urge opposition to it. This amendment micromanages and dictates specific safety and blowout preventer standards for permit applications. Many of these standards would do little or nothing different than what is already being done by the Department of the Interior. However, these restrictions would, if this amendment passes, be etched into law making Congress the technical arbiter and micromanager of Outer Continental Shelf regulations and reducing the flexibility and ability of the department to adapt to new technology and new developments in drilling safety. So if we're lagging behind developments in the industry, this would actually prevent us or could prevent us from adopting those new and better standards in the future. The technical standards proposed in this amendment have not been subject to a thorough review or understanding of the impacts of such changes. This is particularly troubling when you consider 
that this language was written before we even knew why the blowout preventer failed. H.R. 1229 already takes steps to increase the safety of offshore drilling by requiring the Secretary of the Interior to conduct a safety review to ensure that the proposed drilling operations meet, quote, critical safety system requirements, including blowout prevention and oil spill response and containment requirements, unquote. That language is lifted straight out of the bill. So my colleagues on the other side are acting as if nothing has changed and no safety reforms have been made. By doing so, they are ignoring the facts on the ground and the actions of their own party's administration. I'm not willing to indict the administration and say that they have done nothing in this regard. So at this point, I yield, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the balance, uh, I uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Colorado reserves his time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself two minutes again. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, here is the uh, BP uh, Blue Ribbon Commission report uh, that was conducted to investigate and to make recommendations as to what the causes were and what can be done to prevent it from happening again. Right now, nothing that's in this report has been implemented in terms of legislation here on the House floor. So I'll tell you what my bill does. It will require multiple lines of defense against the blowout and ensures that these defenses are redundant so that failure of one does not lead to cascade. First, the, the amendment sets minimum standards for blowout preventers, including a requirement that blowout preventers operate as intended even when the force of an ongoing blowout shifts the drill pipe out of position. The amendment also requires new standards on safe well design and cementing to ensure multiple redundant barriers within the well against uncontrolled oil or gas flow that could lead to a blowout. And the amendment also requires independent third party certification of blowout preventers and well designs. And finally, the language ensures that if the Department of Interior finds that some other measures that it has or may one day require would provide an even higher level of safety that the subsecretary can substitute those better alternatives instead. This is the direction we should be heading in. Uh, and at this point, again, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield one minute to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Landry. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to point out to my colleague that uh, one of my colleagues from Louisiana, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, H.R. 56, uh, puts into law a portion of that, um, that report. And since he's so interested in making sure that some of uh, the information in the president's report becomes law, I certainly hope he will co-sponsor that legislation. I'm sure those in the Gulf would appreciate uh, that piece. I didn't know that he was um, uh, an expert in oil and gas drilling. Uh, you know, because when I go back home and I talk to those in Louisiana, they tell me that they've already instituted safety guidelines above and beyond what the gentleman from Massachusetts puts forth here. The industry is safer today than it was the day before the Deepwater accident. In addition to that, we have the ability now in the Gulf of Mexico that no one else has in the world to cap the type of incident that happened in the Gulf today. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Back is time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. I inquire from the chair how many minutes are remaining on both sides and who has the right to conclude debate. Gentleman from Massachusetts has one and one quarter minutes remaining. Gentleman from Colorado has two minutes remaining. Well, I will be the last the gentleman speaker, from so Colorado I will reserve has the, the balance balance of my close. time. I will reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Massachusetts reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Chairman, I would rather uh, close, so I'll yield back to the gentleman and reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Colorado reserves his time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Yes, okay, great. Um, I yield myself the remaining time. Gentleman is recognized. I agree with the gentleman from Louisiana. I am not an expert on drilling. We are congressional experts, and that's an oxymoron. 
a contradiction in terms like jumbo shrimp or Salt Lake City nightlife. I mean, there is no such thing. We rely upon real experts. Here are the real experts. The Blue Ribbon Commission put together to study what went wrong and what needs to be done. And that's what my amendment will do. My amendment is very close to the legislation that passed 48 to nothing uh, out of the Commerce Committee last year and was later adopted by the House. So all we're doing is just reflecting what all these experts recommended and were finally incorporated. So we can ignore the experts, but then we roll the dice. Uh, and once again, a part of our coastline could be held hostage to an oil company that was trying to save money, but at the risk of endangering the lives and the livelihoods of millions of people off of the coastline of our country. I urge an I vote for the Markey Amendment. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Chairman, I would close by saying that the experts that we should